Stubby was a uh, supposedly a Boston Terrier. Actually, he was mostly mutt. Um, but he had gone to Europe in the war in mm -hmm. 1917 with the 102nd New York Infantry. Mm -hmm. And over there, um, he became quite the hero. He, he apparently um, would be utilized to by the his regiment to go out and look for wounded soldiers of the regiment. And he apparently did this on a number of occasions, uh, at least once of, during which he was wounded. At the end of the war, he was decorated for his valorous service by both the French and the American governments. When the unit came back, Stubby was in the parade as a, in a position of honor as one of the, the heroes for the regiment. Well, one of the members of the regiment happened to uh, enroll in Georgetown University Law School, so he brought Stubby to D.C. and began taking Stubby to Georgetown football games, <laughs> where soon enough mm -hmm. Stubby became the team mascot. Oh. <laughs> and uh, for the next two years, he would be a prominent uh, uh, feature of Georgetown football games. He would, uh, at halftime, be out in the middle of the, the, the field, and he'd be rolling the football around the field with his nose. And it was a <laughs> it was a crowd favorite. So Stubby became the first official Georgetown mascot. And after his passing, uh, there came a bulldog mm -hmm. who eventually was named Jack, and that began the tradition of the Georgetown Bulldogs. But it all goes back to Stubby the Boston Terrier. In the early 1950s, the Prefect of Discipline at Georgetown, now I guess they call him university, uh, Vice President or Dean for Student Development or something of that nature. Anyway, it was the, uh, the Prefect of Discipline, it was a Jesuit. And he had really co-opted, this is in the early 50s, the um, the practice of uh, the kind of student vigilantism that uh, was part of student culture at the time, where, where students would uh, would take um, certain steps before um, key football or basketball games to ward off what were um, enemy designs of the other college or university. Um, so typically, uh, when a, the night before a game. Uh, the Minister of Defense, the Prefect of Discipline, would have his palace guard, which was scores of students, out hiding in bushes around the mm -hmm. campus or going out in cars to scout out the neighborhood mm -hmm. to detect any caravan of <laughs> cars coming from the University of Maryland or American University or wherever. Well, on this particular night, um, the guard spotted a group of Maryland students mm -hmm. coming in to uh, do whatever they were going to do. So the prefect routes out two dormitories of students <laughs> to seize these guys, which they do. And then he has them, he has orders them to uh, shave the guys' heads and oh. brand them with the Georgetown oh, University wow. letters, GU. <laughs> well, the dean of the college who was a very gruff, very sober, no one to suffer fools gladly, he was sleeping nearby. Mm -hmm. And he was awakened by the din of all that was going on. So he finally comes down and put an end to the proceedings mm -hmm. before any of the University of Maryland students could have their heads shaved and <laughs> leave campus with the GU branding. Um, the the prefect of discipline had, had had also taken over the management of hazing on campus. So oh. he would do things like uh, have sophomores um, drive out students from the freshman freshman dorm and have them taken to the upper field, the athletic field, where they'd be forced to do calisthenics or forced to do successive dives off the, the diving board in the swimming pool. Oh. 
it varied, but it, but it was all something of this nature. And then he would have them locked in until the following morning. They couldn't get out. They were soaking wet, oh. locked in the swimming area or on the athletic field. Well, the dean of the college had the final say. Um, at the end of the 1950-51 academic year, through his influence, the prefect of discipline was transferred to Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. That ended the, uh, the palace. <laughs>
were always uh, a strong minority, and there are occasions in the uh, 1850s where they were the apparent majority oh. uh, of students. But there were, from very early on, uh, not only Protestants, but uh, Jews, um, even Asians. Um, the, um, the diversity was really something, it, it was, it was uh, an international student body, indeed international. In the, uh, the first decade of the, uh, of the college, uh, from the 1790s, almost 20% uh, of the student body was coming from uh, places from outside the United States. Now that, that really surprised me. 